me, the most extraordinary thing about the construction of the cathedral is undertaking a project that you knew fully well you did not have the technology to complete. By the time Filippo Brunelleschi is born, the cathedral has already been under construction for 80 years, with no solution in sight to the problem of the dome. Brunelleschi spends his youth being trained not as an architect or stonemason, but in a trade that continues to flourish in Florence to this day. Precious metals. It's a path followed in later years by many artists, including Donatello and Leonardo da Vinci. He began in the workshop when he was 14 years old. His father, Franz Workshop. He apprenticed until he was 17 or 18, and he learned all the techniques typical of the Florentine tradition. To us, in the 21st century, that may seem a slightly odd way to get your start in architecture. But in fact, you could have had no better training in the 15th century to become an architect or a sculptor or the designer of any sort. They worked with gold, they worked with silver. They used their minds as well as their hands. They had to figure out how to make things work both practically and also aesthetically. Brunelleschi first attracts public attention in the year 1401. Just 23, he enters a competition to decorate the most revered building in all of Florence, the Baptistry. For centuries, Florentines, including Dante and the Medicis, have been baptized here and the building needs a new set of ornamented bronze doors. And Filippo Brunelleschi, being very ambitious and very talented, threw his hat into the ring. It's the most important artistic competition for a public work that everyone will see that will immediately create fame and prestige, and he manages to uh, become one of the finalists, along with another uh, beginning master, Lorenzo Ghiberti. The competition involved casting a trial panel, making an experimental piece to show what you could do. So everyone was given the same amount of bronze and told, go away to your workshop and make us something. They produced two panels, which luckily still survive. In these two panels, there's a confrontation between the classical style of Ghiberti and the Renaissance of Brunelleschi. E il rinascimento di Brunelleschi. L'Abramo di Lorenzo Ghiberti. The Abram of Lorenzo Ghiberti is very beautiful. He has a long curly beard, flowing hair. The scene is very decorated. It's very rich in detail. The one from Brunelleschi is one of incredible humanism. Ecco, that's already something new. Look at the way in which Abraham wants to kill his son. While the Abraham of Ghiberti is just in his pose with the knife and the son is there casually, almost like he's ready to be stabbed. In the one Bardunelleschi, he's taken his son by the throat and you can see that he has placed his hand where the blood is flowing because he wanted to stun the child because he didn't want the son to feel the pain when he stabbed him with a knife. This is the creation of an incredible genius. Above all, it defines Brunelleschi as an artist. That is the difference this brought to the art of 1400 in the Renaissance. This is the Renaissance. Both hands are masterpieces, but Brunelleschi's vision may have been too far ahead of its time. The commission goes to Lorenzo Ghiberti. Losing the commission to Lorenzo Ghiberti, I think there's no question, hurt Brunelleschi very badly and in many ways shaped his career 
and the way that he proceeded after that. Brunelleschi may or may not have understood why he lost, but certainly uh, from that point, Filippo Brunelleschi must feel that he has to carve out a new niche for himself. Following the competition, the disappointed Brunelleschi leaves Florence. Little is known about his life for the next 15 years, but it's clear he spends time in Rome, studying the ancient monuments. Some believe he's already preparing himself for a future challenge, building the dome on the Florence Cathedral. Here in the nearby park, Massimo Ricci's dome is at a critical point. He and his helpers are preparing for its biggest test yet. With the walls increasing height, Ricci is concerned about having his students continue the work. So a new team has arrived in town to help push Ricci's experiment forward. They are all master bricklayers from the United States. Nice to meet you, sir. Leave my sack in your boat. John Knight, nice to meet you. I think we're starting here. They're members of the International Masonry Institute, an organization that trains workers in the craft of bricklaying. Quarter inch. Half inch. Probably a little no inches here. No, it's Yeah, sorry. Each one has more than 20 years on the job. Not in Florence for the food or the works of art. They are here to lay some bread. There you go, perfect. The bricklayers understand the basic structure of Brunelleschi's plan. The eight corners of the dome where the walls meet, act like the ribs of the dome. Once these corner ribs meet at the top, they form powerful arches. Together with smaller interior arches, this goes a long way toward holding the 40,000 ton mass together. Basically, it's a series of four Gothic arches. Arches that come up this way. So if you see the, this rib here, the opposite one there is gonna come up, you know, like that, so you've got a series of four gothic arches that all should meet in the middle. That's the key. Working on the model, the Americans will be confronting the key mystery of the dome. Until the curving walls connect at the top, what keeps them from falling to the ground? And what magic did Brunelleschi use to defy gravity? You know, I've built a lot of things from stadiums, Baseball, football, but I've never ever worked on something like this. We use different mechanisms to hold arches in place, and once we're done, we take them out. But this is freestanding, which I've never ever seen construction like this before. Their first task will be to literally learn the ropes and begin to understand Ricci's theory. They, they are very uh, okay. <laughs> By 1480, more than 100 years after work had begun, the enormous cathedral is almost complete. It's bigger than any other in the world. But without a dome, it is in danger of becoming the world's largest joke. In the beginning, it's clear the people of the city were worried about this problem. All the Florentines were talking about it. They knew very well that they risked looking bad in front of their rivals. To hope. They realize they feel they has got to the point where they cannot put off any longer how they're going to build this. And so they put forth a competition uh, saying uh, that whoever has any ideas about how on earth we can do this, uh, we're open, it's sort of answers on a postcard, please. They didn't have any idea what they were going to do. Non sapeva che pesci prendere. Proposals for the dome come pouring into the committee. 
but they all share a fatal flaw. They depend on using wooden framework to keep the bricks in place during construction. Only one candidate promises to build a freestanding, self-sustaining dome. Filippo Brunelleschi. He tells the committee he has figured out a way for the dome to stand on its own, even as it is curving inward. The financial advantage of that must have been extraordinary, but the skepticism was probably even greater, in the sense that how could that be possible? What will prevent that structure uh, from simply sliding out and caving in as we're building it? But there's a problem. The 41-year-old Brunelleschi has never built anything. When they get to that final piece, I mean, this is really the climax of the entire two-century construction history of the church. Who is this man working in jewelry who now steps forward and says, look, I have the credentials, I have the know-how, I have the inspiration to actually design the structure, and I, would you have trusted him? I mean, I would not have. Perhaps Brunelleschi's supreme self-confidence impresses the committee because he clearly does not have all of the problems worked out in advance. I think that Brunelleschi had a very clear idea of how to build that dome, but realized that there were certain construction details that he could only figure out as the work was in progress. Filippo, be being extremely secretive and not wanting anyone else to know his plan, said, I'll show you how to do it when you give me the job. Give me the job and I'll begin doing it. And you'll see that it works. Everyone else had shown uh, his plan. Brunelleschi refused. He said, I know how to build it. Only I know how to build it. I've studied the ancient Roman structures. I already see it built. Uh, and, and so they said, well, you have to tell us something. So he said, bring me an egg. And he said, anyone who can keep this egg standing upright on the marble tabletop will understand how I'm going to build the dome. Imagine all of these eminent master masons from all over Europe trying to get it to stand upright um, on its own, all of them fail. So they give the egg to Burleski and say, show us what you mean. And Bazzari, who tells this story in the 16th century, uses a very vulgar term. Uh, he says, uh, people rook the cool al uh, People, Filippo's nickname, broke the egg's ass. Uh, so he breaks the bottom of the egg. They say, well, we could have done that too. And uh, Burleski says, yes, and you would be able to build the dome if you know what I know. 17 years earlier, his radical vision may have cost him the competition for the baptistry doors. This time, Brunelleschi keeps his ideas secret for as long as possible, asking the committee to trust him. Had he told the assembled company his secret, it would have been something that they wouldn't have understood. A special brick pattern, a special kind of brick work that he was going to use in the interior of the dome. In April 1420, the committee comes to a decision. They choose Brunelleschi, along with two others, including his old rival Ghiberti, to build the dome. If he ever was going to have a moment of doubt, I think that would have been the one, because he would have seen up close and personal the magnitude of the task that literally lay before him at that point, because he would have looked across this chasm, this yawning gap. He must have, at some level, gulped and thought, am I going to be able to do this? Brunelleschi quickly emerges as the leader and takes on his first challenge lifting the building materials 170 feet to the work platform above.